This section will introduce you to procedures for assisting vessels, aircraft and helicopters. Basic search pattern theory and lookout procedures. Introduction to rescue equipment. Distress notification from a vessel or aircraft can be given by an alarm signal or a distress call from another vessel at sea, either directly or by relay. A distress call or message from an aircraft. This usually occurs by relay from a coast radio station. An alert sent from a vessel's alerting equipment and then relayed short a ship. Visual signals or sound signals from a nearby distressed craft. The following immediate action should be taken by any ship receiving a distress message. Acknowledge receipt of the message. Gather the following information from the craft in distress if possible. The position of the distressed craft. The distressed craft's identity, call sign and name. The number of persons on board. The type of assistance required. The nature of distress or casualty. The number of victims, if any. The distressed craft's course and speed. The type of craft and cargo carried. Any other pertinent information that might facilitate the rescue. The assisting vessels should maintain contact with the distressed craft and advise the search and rescue unit about the situation. All available means should be used to keep track of the distressed craft at all times. The following information should be communicated to the distressed craft. Own vessel's identity, call sign and name. Own vessel's position. Own vessel's speed and estimated time of arrival to distressed craft's site. The distressed craft's true bearing and distance from ship. A vessel en route to assist a distressed craft should have the following life-saving equipment ready for possible use. Lifeboat. Inflatable life raft. Survival suits for the crew. Life jackets. Life boys. Breaches boys. Portable, medium, high and very high frequency radios. Line throwing apparatus. Buoyant lifelines. Hauling lines. Non sparking boat hooks or grappling hooks. Hatches. Rescue baskets. Litters. Pilot ladders. Scrambling nets. Copies of the International Code of Signals. Firefighting equipment. Portable pumps, binoculars and cameras, balers and oars. A vessel en route to assist a distressed craft should have the following signalling equipment ready for possible use. Signalling lamps, searchlights, torches, flare pistol with colour-coded signal flares. Buoyant VHF UHF marker beacons, floating lights, smoke generators, flame and smoke floats, dye markers, loud hailers, a vessel en route to assist a distressed craft should have the following medical equipment ready for possible use. Stretchers. Blankets, medical supplies and medicines, clothing, food, shelter.
A vessel en route to assist a distressed craft should have the following miscellaneous equipment ready for possible use. If fitted, a gantry crane for hoisting on each side of the ship with a cargo net for recovery of the survivors. A line running from bow to stern at the water's edge on both sides for boats and craft to secure alongside. On the lowest weather deck, pilot ladders and man ropes to assist survivors boarding the vessel. Vessels lifeboats ready for use as a boarding station. Line throwing apparatus for making connection with either the ship in distress or survival craft. Floodlights set in appropriate locations if recovery is at night. A vessel en route whose master decides not to proceed to the scene of distress due to the sailing time involved and in the knowledge that a rescue operation is underway should make an appropriate entry in the ship's logbook. If the master had previously acknowledged and responded to the alert, report the decision not to proceed to the search and rescue service concerned. Consider reports unnecessary if no contact has been made with the search and rescue service. Reconsider the decision not to proceed nor report to the search and rescue service when a vessel in distress is far from land or in an area where the density of shipping is low. The search and rescue mission coordinator normally provides the search action plan, while the on-scene coordinator implements the plan on-scene. A search action plan message includes six parts. Situation overview. Search area overview. Execution plan. Coordination required. Communications channels. Reports on weather, rescue progress, etc. When doing your own search planning, the following points should be taken into consideration. Estimating the most probable position of a distressed craft or survivors, taking drift into consideration. Determining the search area. Selecting search and rescue facilities and equipment to be used. Selecting search pattern. Planning on scene coordination. The on scene coordinator should coordinate communications on scene and ensure that reliable communications are maintained. SAR facilities normally report to the on scene coordinator on an assigned frequency. If a frequency shift is carried out, instructions should be provided about what to do if intended communications cannot be re-established on the new frequency. All search and rescue facilities should carry a copy of the International Code of Signals, which contains communications information for use on scene, which will include primary and secondary frequencies. The following visual means of communication should be used when appropriate. Signaling lamp. International code flags. International distress signals. Lookouts, also referred to as observers or scanners, are very important for effective searches. In daylight, with good visibility, place the lookouts high on the vessel. In darkness and low visibility, place the lookouts on the bows, as far forward and as low to the water edge as possible, to hear any calls for help and to establish the best night vision. A supply drop by aircraft during a search and rescue mission can include dropping life rafts and equipment to craft in distress, lowering trained individuals from helicopters, or evacuating survivors by helicopter. Ships in distress or survivors may be supplied by search and rescue aircraft with special items of droppable equipment.
Containers and packages dropped to survivors from search and rescue aircraft should be clearly marked in English and one or more other languages, as well as having self-explanatory symbols. Containers and packages should have coloured streamers according to the following code: red, medical supplies and first aid equipment; blue, food and water; yellow, blankets and protective clothing. Black, miscellaneous equipment. If an emergency occurs within the range of a helicopter, the helicopter is a very efficient rescue machine. Helicopter operations are planned and executed according to regulations given by the country of registry. However, normally rescue operations follow international standards. For evacuation of persons. The end of the winching cable may be provided with a rescue sling, basket, net, litter, or seat. The most widely used means for evacuating persons is the rescue sling. Slings are suited for quickly picking up uninjured persons, but are unsuitable for persons with injuries. The sling is put on in much the same way as one puts on a coat. Ensuring that the loop of the sling passes behind the back and under both armpits, the person using the sling must face the hook. Hands should be clasped in front. The person should not sit in the sling, nor should the sling be unhooked. Some search and rescue helicopters use the double lift method. Which consists of a normal sling and a seating belt manned by a helicopter crew. This method is suitable for pickup of incapacitated persons from land, water, or the deck of a vessel. Use of the rescue basket does not require any special measures. To use the basket, the person merely climbs in, remains seated, and holds on. The rescue net has a conical bird cage appearance and is open on one side. To use the net, the person merely enters the opening, sits in the net, and holds on. Patients will, in most cases, be disembarked by means of a rescue litter. Bridles are fitted to this litter and can quickly and safely be hooked on and off. If the litter is provided by the helicopter. The litter should be unhooked while the patient is being loaded. The rescue seat looks like a three-pronged anchor with two flat flukes or seats. Persons to be hoisted merely sit astride on one or two of the seats and wrap their arms around the shank. This device can be used to winch two persons at once. Helicopter operations during search and rescue operations may include landing and winching on land or at sea. On a ship, three types of operating areas may be available: full landing area. This operating area is suitable for all helicopters and may be used for landing and winching. Restricted landing area. This area should only be used for landing or winching by certain smaller helicopters. Winching area. For a winching area, the maneuvering zone must be at least 30.5 meters in diameter, and no obstacles higher than three meters. Communication between ship and helicopter must be clear. And fully understood at all times. To avoid misunderstandings, internationally developed phrases for communication between ship and helicopter have been developed and should be used whenever appropriate. A briefing to discuss the safety aspects and operational details of helicopter ship operations should be held for all involved personnel. Prior to the operation's commencement, wherever available, the following firefighting equipment should be ready during helicopter operations: at least two dry powder extinguishers 
with aggregate capacity of not less than 45 kilos. A suitable foam application system, capable of delivering a foam solution at a rate of not less than 6 litres per minute for each square metre of clear zone for at least 5 minutes. CO2 extinguishers, with a capacity of not less than 18 kilos. A deck water system, capable of delivering at least two jets of water to any part of the helicopter operating area. At least two fire hose nozzles, which should be of dual purpose type. Fire resistant blankets and gloves. Sufficient fire proximity suits. Portable firefighting equipment for oil fires. Firefighting pump running. Hoses connected, ready for use. For survivors in the water, the rescuing vessel may find it necessary to launch lifeboats, rig scramble nets, launch life rafts, have crew members suitably equipped to enter the water to assist survivors, be prepared to provide initial medical treatment. In heavy weather, the use of oil for reducing the effect of the sea should be considered. Vegetable oils and animal oils, including fish oils, are most suitable for quelling waves. Lubricating oil may be used. Fuel oil should not be used, except as a last resort, as it is harmful to persons in the water. When an aircraft decides to ditch in the vicinity of a ship, the ship should transmit homing bearings to the aircraft, transmit signals enabling the aircraft to take its own bearings. By day, make black smoke. By night, direct a searchlight vertically and turn on all deck lights. A ship which knows that an aircraft intends to ditch should prepare to give the pilot the following information. Wind direction and force. Direction, height, length of primary and secondary swell systems. Current state of the sea. Current state of the weather. Based on this information and other relevant parameters, the pilot will choose his own ditching heading. As aircraft usually sink quickly, often within minutes, the ship should try to be as close as possible to the ditching point taking its own safety into account. If the ship knows the planned ditching heading, the ship should set course parallel to the ditching heading. If the ship doesn't know the ditching heading, the ship should set course parallel to the main swell system and into the wind component. When the search object has been located, indication should be given to the survivors that they have been sighted by the following methods. Flashing a signalling lamp or searchlight, or firing two, preferably green, signal flares a few seconds apart. The pilot may be able to fly low over the search object with landing lights on or rocking the wings. If unable to effect an immediate rescue, consider dropping communication and survival equipment. Keep the distress scene in sight. Thoroughly survey the scene and accurately plot its location. Mark it with dye marker, smoke float or floating beacons. Report the sighting to the search and rescue mission coordinator, giving relevant information about the situation. A fixed-wing aircraft may drop equipment to survivors and direct rescue facilities. They can mark the position, so long as they can remain on scene by serving as radio and radar beacon. Show lights. Drop flares. Provide radio signals for DF and homing by other rescue facilities. Helicopters have proven to be extremely effective rescue machines and can be used to rescue survivors by winching or by landing on a suitable platform or vessel. Rescue helicopters with a properly trained crew can operate safely also during very bad weather conditions. Due to their versatility, 
helicopters should be used whenever possible. Water landings may be possible by using amphibious helicopters. Under favourable conditions, these aircraft can be used for rescue operations in inland seas, large lakes, bays or coastal waters. Open seas operations should only be contemplated with amphibians and seaplanes designed for that purpose. The duties of a land facility at a distress scene include giving initial medical treatment, collecting and preserving medical and technical data for investigatory purposes, making a preliminary examination of the wreckage, reporting to the search and rescue mission coordinator, evacuating survivors by whatever means are available. Aircraft crash sites have special requirements. For military aircraft, extreme care should be taken to avoid hazardous materials or triggering ejection seats. Do not disturb aircraft wreckage except to assist in recovery of survivors. Except for compelling reasons, bodies or human remains should not be moved without authorization from the search and rescue mission coordinator. It is very important to try to take immediate care of survivors. Here are some reasons why. After rescue, survivors may require hospital treatment. Survivors must be delivered to a place of safety as quickly as possible. The search and rescue mission coordinator should be advised if ambulances are needed. SAR personnel should be alert and ensure that after rescue, survivors are not to be left alone particularly if injured or showing signs of physical or mental exhaustion. When survivors are delivered to a hospital, the person in charge of the delivering facility should provide information on all initial medical treatment given to the survivors. Survivors should be questioned about the distressed craft as soon as possible. Their input may be able to further assist in the search and rescue operation, future search and rescue operations, or the prevention of incidents in the future. If the survivor is frightened or excited, the questioner should proceed carefully. Searching for and recovering bodies is not normally considered to be part of search and rescue operations. However, handling of human remains may at times be necessary. Human remains at an aircraft crash site should not be disturbed or removed without authorization from the search and rescue mission coordinator, except for compelling reasons. Without exposing rescuers to danger, an attempt should be made to identify deceased persons. When human remains are recovered during a search and rescue operation, a waybill should be made out for each person. Considerations for transport of human remains include On vessels, body bags or sailcloth should be carried. SAR aircraft do not normally transport human remains. Immediately after returning to the base specified by the coordination centre, the remains must be handed over to the appropriate authorities, accompanied by the waybill. If it is known or suspected that a deceased person had an infectious disease, all material and objects which have been in direct contact with the deceased person must be cleaned and disinfected or destroyed. A search and rescue operation often creates great interest with relatives of the victims, the general public, and with radio, television and newspapers. Contacts with the media are normally the responsibility of the coordination centre or higher authority. A media spokesman should exercise good judgment and avoid personal judgments or demanding information on the crew or missing person. Judgment, experience or training of the pilot in command, captain or the crew. Denigrating opinions on the conduct of the search and rescue operations. 
personal opinions or theories as to why the accident occurred or how it could have been avoided. Giving names of missing or distressed persons until every effort has been made to inform the relatives. Giving the name of the operator or the owner of the aircraft, ship or other craft before they have been informed. Revealing names of persons who have given information related to the case. SAR facilities may be required to perform operations other than search and rescue, which if not carried out could result in a SAR incident. Here are some examples of such incidents. Collision at sea. Loss of propulsion. Fire. Grounding. Vessel taking in water. Insufficient remaining fuel. Medical assistance. Pirate attack, hijacking attempt, assistance after a vessel has been abandoned. The purpose of the intercept and escort service is to minimize delay in reaching the scene of distress and to eliminate a lengthy search for survivors. Intercept procedures apply to both vessels and aircraft. The higher speed of an aircraft often requires a more rapid calculation of the intercept course and speed. Three types of direct intercept are possible. Head-on. Overtaking. Offset or beam-on intercepts. The different maritime and aeronautical radio bands make direct communications between merchant vessels and aircraft difficult. Merchant ships are normally informed about an aircraft distress situation by broadcast messages from CRS on the international distress frequencies. Assistance that might be provided by a ship in a ditching situation. Establishing and maintaining communications with the aircraft or its survivors. Locating the aircraft. Providing approach assistance. Providing illumination. Rescue and care of survivors. Training of search and rescue personnel can include study of the application of search and rescue procedures, techniques and equipment through lectures, demonstrations, films, search and rescue manuals and journals. Assisting in or observing actual operations. Exercises in which personnel are trained to coordinate individual techniques and procedures in a simulated operation. The mandatory minimum requirements for training of masters of merchant ships in search and rescue operations are contained in the International Convention on Standards of Training, Certification and Watchkeeping for Seafarers, 1995.